Hello and welcome to this video. So this is a reaction video to the stock analysis video of Micron done by Everything Money. I covered the stock on my channel a while back, so I decided to see how they evaluate this stock. And I will also like to see the parallel between their approach and mine. But it will be good to do a comparison to see the common denominators in our thought process. For those of you who are new to this channel, I'm Dr. Subail Khan. I'm a business strategist, experienced investor, award-winning scientist, and also held the business owners as a coach and sales mentor. Paul, we've gotten a lot of requests for Micron, ticker symbol is MU. We're going to look at it today. We will look at the financials behind Micron. But Paul, let's talk, use our eight pillars analysis to see the financials behind Micron, baby, what's the market cap? So basically my philosophy is the same. It is like chasing the targets. And once the target is qualified in the first step, I evaluate it again by looking at the current market state to see if it is a good time to buy it or not. So I first analyze the stocks via 14 dimensions of value centric investment feasibility to qualify a great target, which is of course a great company and then chase the qualified company until the stock price of that company is cheap so that I don't end up paying more for what I am getting. I also use another step which consists of six dimensions of current market states so that I can look at the market sentiment, the price action, the hedge fund activity and insiders activity, etc. to really gauge if it is the right time to start accumulating the stock which I have already qualified in the first step or not. So in my case, if I get a score of 75 for the dimensional value centric analysis for the past five or three years, I still need to see if the stock is very expensive or not since of course PE ratio is one of the dimensions in the dimensional analysis but it is just one of the 14 dimensions so even if I get a very good score for the 14 value centric dimensions where the PE ratio threshold which I look for which is um, 20 even if the company doesn't qualify over there, still the dimensional score will be very high. But that is telling me that you have to wait now and you shouldn't pay more for the value that you are getting as a result of purchasing the stock. All right, guys, it's an $84 billion company. Five-year PE of only 13.5. That's a check mark there. We want it less than 22.5. The recent PE for the last year is 20. That's okay. Um, no dividend. And the five-year return on invested capital is kind of weak, 6.2%. This is pillar number percent. two. Yeah, we want a five-year return on invested capital. Uh, Greater than 9%. 9%, right. So, so far we have one check and one X. Um, pretty good profit margin here. Um, so, so far I'm not, I mean, five-year average free cash flow of three billion, but last year's was 560. I don't know why that is, maybe less sales, whatever it is. But um, okay, so, so far I'm not like totally turned off. But not totally turned on, I see. Correct. I'm not totally turned on. I've seen you fully talked with some stocks. It's not this one yet. Yeah, Pillar number three is revenue growth over the past five years. So in my analysis, I look at three different time frames to evaluate the value-centric investment feasibility of a stock. And it gives me an idea of how the stock is actually evolving with time and how feasible it is becoming with the passage of time as a value-centric investment. So the idea over here is to gauge whether with the passage of time it is becoming more conducive or feasible as a value investment or not. Now, for example, if I analyze the stock over the past 10 years and if I get an uh, investment feasibility score which is quite low, but then in the past five years if I see that the score has improved and it goes to 80 or above that, then I will say that, okay, hmm, this company is really a good investment and I will buy it if it is available for cheap. So the whole idea of looking at the company over different time frames is that the company might have done some changes in their business model. Maybe they have shifted the way they operate. For example, many retailers are now going online and many companies in future will embrace the winds of change that can sometimes blow really fast. And that might mean that the company has to then incorporate different novel technologies such as the blockchain technology to optimize their processes and as industries evolve to adapt to changing needs and desires of the market and embrace new trends and technologies, their operational efficiency increases. They become more efficient value centric machines. In other words, they become more relevant to the current business environment and to their customers. For example, IBM evolved tremendously and before they were computer manufacturers, but now they are not. Also, the business model of Microsoft is evolving with time and same goes for a lot of other companies. 
17.4 billion to 25 billion. Now, something interesting. Go ahead. 17.4, 28, 27, uh -oh. 20, uh -oh. and 25. Mm -hmm. so even though it's a check mark, is this COVID related or was this an acqui a disposition of a company and then they bought another one? I don't know, but this is part of what we're trying to do when we look at these companies is look at their financials and say, what is the story being told here? To me, I see acquisition here because the chances of a company like this having this kind of revenue all along and then all of a sudden skyrocket tells me there's probably an acquisition. This drop, maybe they sold the division, I don't know. So I fully agree with Paul over here. So in my approach, I emphasize a lot on the importance of diagnostic skills, meaning if a dimension fails, then we must see what is the underlying reason and why did the company fail along that dimension? Just through three pillars, I think this is probably a more deeper dive than 99.9% uh, .9 of the entire population has ever done on a simple stock. Well, right? of course, and doing very little to understand this is gonna do monumental things for your portfolio. It literally will, over long periods of time, really increase the returns in your portfolio. So pillar, pillar number four is profit growth over the past five years, baby cakes. 2.55 to 4.13, check mark. Um, Uncle Seth, look at this. Oh, wait a minute now. Two and a half to 12 gabillion dollars. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna scroll up a little bit. Tell me. I'm gonna go to other income. Where the heck is it? Go on. I'm looking. Tickle me now. Pre-tax income. Oh, wait, what? Yeah, there you go. What's going on here? I'm not Paul? seeing how this happened. <laughs> okay, well, this is obviously something to look at. Shares outstanding, Uncle Seth. 1.1 billion to 1.12 billion. It's an X, not by much, but it's still an X nonetheless. It is very important because if the issuance of shares is not done with a solid purpose, for example, to pay the owners of a company that is acquired by issuing more shares or via stock split, then it means that it dilutes the value of the shares which the shareholders already have. However, in my case, I have a dimension which looks at the average share dilution. And if it is less than 3%, then I say that, okay, fine. This much printing of shares is okay, but it is good to see that they are taking it into account. But in their case, okay, fine. If the company is printing more shares, they say that, okay, the company fails along that pillar. Or in my case, it will be along that dimension. Pillar number six, Paul. This is total long-term liabilities divided yep. by five-year free cash flow. And what is under five? So we go to the five-year free cash flow number on the main page. It's about three billion multiplied by five. So we want their total long-term liabilities to be less than $15 billion. Why? Very simple. Less debt means less likely to go under. Obviously, there's certain debt that's manageable and some that's not. I look at this number, I pick this metric out of looking at an average of the last five years and selecting five. Does that mean this is the exact number? No, every industry is different, but it's a starting point. So we go to the balance sheet, scroll all the way to the bottom, $8.2 billion. So definite check there. We want it under 15, it's almost half that. That is great news. Um, now for the big mamma jamma, we have cash flow. Now remember guys, cash flow is cash from operations, less your capital expenditures. You use this money to pay dividends, buy back shares, make acquisitions, and pay down debt. And make Paul happy because Paul likes cash flow. Mm -hmm. Now on big companies, I especially like cash flow. What we do is we go back and we had 454 million to 560 million. That's a check mark. Okay, I don't like this, Uncle Seth. Look at this nonsense now. Yeah, I don't like this. Half a billion to seven billion. And then the average is three. This is totally misleading. Ugh. Yuck. Yeah, I don't like this very much, Uncle Seth. How and then look at the last, look at the, the previous years. So it this is a check mark. Bonkers. And then three billion times 20 is a $60 billion market cap. What we do is we take the five years of free cash flow, multiply it by 20 as kind of like an idea of what do we want to pay for this company. And it's saying 60 billion, so that's an X. Mm. Guys, my personal opinion is I'm avoiding this company. So of course, free cash flow is very important and it is one of the most important dimensions in my value-centric analysis. So free cash flow, as Paul mentioned, it is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So capital expenditures is the money that the company invests back into the fixed assets like the buildings, their equipment, or development of skills of their staff and so on. The reason is that at the end of the day, business needs to invest a certain amount of money into their assets to sustain themselves. 
These assets include things like real estate, machinery, or computer equipment, etc. So in short, the businesses do these investments to sustain their businesses and keep it growing. And free cash flow is very important because as Paul mentioned, it is used for paying dividends, buying back the shares, and acquisitions and so on. So the free cash flow gives us an overall idea also of how efficient a value centric machine the company is, how operationally efficient it is and competitiveness and so on and so forth. So it is the leftover money which the company has available to it, which it can use to pay dividends and uh, make acquisitions and so on. So I personally like the approach of Paul a lot. It puts the things into perspective and that is the most important thing. And it definitely helps us in doing further due diligence, which is similar to my approach. As I always say, the 14 dimensions that I use act as a disciplined approach of analyzing the stock, but then we need to have good diagnostic skills to see why a dimension has failed if it has failed. And trust me, if you look at the stocks in this way, I mean, if you analyze them along these 14 dimensions or like the approach of Paul, where he analyzes the stock along eight pillars, I think you can do really well in your stock investments in the long run. When I look at the saying, there's so much going on here, so much up and down. The, you know, price of free cash flow is currently 150, but the PE is, I just look at it going, you know what? I'm not even gonna look at it, but this, this analyzer tool is awesome. You can put in how many years you want, how many assumptions you wanna do. Fill in your assumptions and it'll spit out a number. I'll just do it just to show you, but don't take any. This is the prices it sets to pay between 13 and 53 based on these assumptions. So if you want a 12, 12 and a half percent return over the next seven years, you, you got to pay be, between 20 yeah, and 30 bucks. You need to be paying 25 bucks for this. 25 bucks a share. So these are the investment feasibility scores which I obtained. So looking at the investment feasibility score over a time frame of 10 years, we can see that all the dimensions over here are a pass out of 14, except two, which are the average ROIC is over 15%. That is not the case. And the second one is, is the price to free cash flow on average less than 20? No, that is also not the case. So except these two dimensions, all these dimensions are a pass. So feel free to pause the video and have a look at all these 14 dimensions if you want. And looking at the time frame of the last five years, we can see that now the average ROIC is over 15%. So that fail over a time frame of 10 years have now converted into a pass. But the price to free cash flow is not under 20. So that still remains a fail. However, now over a time frame of five years, the dimension which asks the question is free cash flow growth is at least 10%, it fails. However, over the time frame of 10 years, it was a pass. And now looking at a time frame of the last three years, we get the exact same two fails, which shows a hundred percent correlation as far as the performance along these 14 dimensions is concerned over a time frame of five years and three years. And as I mentioned in my past videos, we normally look for a feasibility score of 75%. But over here, we can see that the score is huge. It is 86%. So in the end, I would like to say that even though my dimensional analysis paints a very different picture for the past 10 years, the past five years and past three years, as you can see in my video, which I published a while back. But anyways, I like their approach. It is very similar to my approach of analyzing the stocks and there is no right or wrong here. One needs to have a disciplined approach and then good diagnostic skills to shortlist stocks that are a good long-term value investment. So thank you for the video, Paul, and looking forward to meeting you someday in USA. Thank you very much. Bye-bye and take care. Bye.